So we were thinking, and yes, I realize that's a dangerous thing to do, but we were thinking that as long as a new Swedish line of tanks is coming out in World of Tanks, it would be a good idea to do a series of episodes on Swedish tanks for Inside the Chieftain's Hatch. And where better to find Swedish tanks to film than, well, Sweden? So we made a few phone calls and the lads here at Arsenal and have been nice enough to let us clamber around some of their vehicles. So we'll be here for the next few episodes showing you some of this unique tank production history. We're going to start at the start. This is going to be our first ever Tier 1 vehicle. So we're looking basically at World War I technology, which will be a bit of a novelty for us. The story begins with the Sturmpanzer A7V, that big German monstrosity with a 20-man crew that looked like basically a big box trundling across the battlefield with a small little gun sticking out the front. It was a little bit cumbersome and a little bit unsatisfactory. So a development program was started for something perhaps a little bit lighter, a little bit faster, that could be used for exploitation. After you punch through the front lines, you go around marauding the enemy's rear. It's a pretty similar concept to, say, the British Whippet light tank. The result was the LK-1, the Leichte Kampfwagen. And it looked actually rather a lot like a Whippet. Uh, maybe it's a case of form following function, or maybe they just simply copied the good idea. I'm not entirely sure. The problem with the LK-1, though, was it had no armor worthy of the name, so they tried again, making the LK-2. The LK-2 added one additional feature, it had a rotating turret up top. Now, come the end of the war, the LKs had not really been built. A couple of parts were lying around, but that was about as far as it went. Along come the Swedes. The Swedes are going, you know, we're kind of interested in this new tank technology. We can't afford a British tank. And uh, by the way, we would like a little bit extra security for the royal family if there should be a communist insurrection. So they purchased the 10 vehicles in secret. They labeled the parts agricultural machinery, basically. Transferred them over here and put them together, resulting in the Stridswagen M21. The vehicle was designed to use as many commercial parts as possible. As a result, the heart of the system is a Daimler-Benz 1910. It is a four-cylinder inline, cranks at about 55 horsepower. This gets the vehicle to trundle along at a good 16 kilometers an hour, which by World War I standards was actually pretty good. Now, of course, there's far more to it than just the engine. The engine then goes through the powertrain and to the rear drive wheels. As an aside, as we go through the video, you might see a couple of cutaways of one of these vehicles with the body removed. This is actually an M29. It's the improved version of the M21. They put a new engine up front, uh, but the general layout and the configuration of the mechanism through the rear is the same. So of course the power, once it goes from the sprocket wheel, has to make its way to the track. And if you look at the running gear, it actually looks all very whippetesque as well. You have the same general shape of the higher front with the lower rear. You got the mud chutes all the way down the length to let all the dirt fall through and not get caught in anything. There are some differences though when you go into the details. The wheels are all sprung. I mean, they're not big springs, it's not a huge amount of travel, but they do have some range of movement. Also, each wheel is attached to, I'll call it a bogey for lack of a better term. Uh, there are four wheels per one of these units, and these units will have a little bit of flex. Uh, not suspension, just a little bit of rotation, and this will help you get over some of the rough ground a bit better. Another difference you'll see between this and a Whippet is if you look at the British tanks, you'll see that they're only balanced on the middle, say, five or six road wheels. All the other road wheels are off the ground, and the reason they did that was to make the tank easier to steer. And if you were on hard surface, you didn't need the extra contact length. If you went into soft ground, the tank would sink a little bit, and more and more road wheels would be in contact. You look at this tank, however, and pretty much everything from here back is in contact with the ground. Whether or not this made life easy to steer, I'm not entirely sure. 
If you look a little bit further forward, you can see the track tension system that is basically stolen right off of the British tanks. And you know, why not? If it's a good idea, if it works. And you just unbolt the locking nut over there, screw around with your tensioner, lock it back in, you're good. The tracks are a single pin type. As you can see, they're basic cast. This is not the original track type which came with the tank that had a few problems, so they changed it. Uh, the single pins are held in place by these cotter pins here. And uh, it looks like all they did was once they put the cotter pin in, they then hammered at it a little bit to bend it out of shape, uh, which can only say great things about uh, how you get them out again. While I'm down here, something that has just caught my eye is an example of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, is this Zert fitting, AKA the grease nipple. And you look at it and you realize my God, we're still using almost 100 years later the exact same design. I had no idea they were this old. Then again, I never looked into it. So as you come around to the front of the tank, it's a good opportunity to show you the construction technique. And of course, remember, this is when tanks are first really being built. Nobody had entirely sorted it out. Curiously, I'm told that the metric system and the imperial system for thread sizes are intermixed in various parts of the tank. Nobody can tell me why. Of course, it was a German vehicle, but industrial standards 1919, who is to say? The front plate is 14 millimeters thick and is angled slightly forward. Not only does it add a little bit more protection, it also allows room for the air to come in for the cooling for the very large radiator, which is located back here. Because you might want to access the radiator from time to time, this plate is hinged and it has basically nut heads on the bolts that allows you to unscrew and then lower down the plate. The chassis, however, isn't bolted, it's riveted. Okay, nothing too unusual there. Until you realize that all of these protrusions here are not rivets, they're actually bolt heads as well with a nut on the far side. Now, it's obvious that they were not expecting these plates to be taken off and put back on with anywhere near the same amount of frequency as you might want to open up the front. So perhaps only if in case of battle damage would you then try to figure out how do you hold the smooth bolt still while you undo the nut on the far side. As you move down, you can also see the starter handle, which of course, as you can imagine, cranks away. Uh, initially, this was the only way of starting the vehicle. You had to get out and crank it. Now, by the time you moved to the M29, there was a starter handle on the inside of the tank as well. And better yet, there's also the addition of an electric starter. So we move back to the engine bay again, and you have a closer look at the engine. You can see it looks like nothing as much as it does two two-cylinder banks, which are bolted onto the same crankshaft. This goes forward and drives by way of what appears to be a leather belt the fan for the single rather large radiator. As you move to the walls, you can see the two fuel tanks, one on each side, which are filled by use of a large port forward and low. So I have to assume you have to use a long funnel with a, a, a long tube to get the fuel down into the tanks. As you look forward, you can see the air cleaner and then the wooden, well, I guess I'll call it a firewall because I don't know what else to call it. Uh, in addition to it not stopping fires, because it is wood, uh, you can also see that there is a gap between the wall and the outer skin of the vehicle, allowing nice clear passage of gases and air uh, one side of the compartment to the other. So come around to the back, dominated by one of the large doors. Point out at the top first, the looks like a fire extinguisher bottle. It's actually a fuel tank. It is fuel for the internal lighting system. As you can imagine that there's no electrics on this tank. Come around, you can see the recovery system is basically a chain with a hook on the end. And we have what has got to be one of the world's first tanker bars. Exhaust on the lower left, and the door is held in place by a simple but actually quite effective spring-loaded catch system. So let's open it up, 
and have a look inside. Hey, here we are. Inside what is effectively a World War I tank. And it is... It's actually kind of amazing how much technology has progressed considering what I'm used to today or what you would find in a World War II tank. There is nothing in here. Um, in fact, I think there's less than there should be because I don't see the internal light systems here. As you saw the fuel tank for the light and I guess the lights have been dismounted. Not that there was ever very much in here to begin with. This is a very simple turret. In order to traverse, there's a couple of handles on either side of the gun. There's a little shoulder pad back here to brace against, and you quite simply use your muscle power to traverse this turret around. And I hope it's well balanced, and you know you can do it if it's not level. To see out, he has these little vision slits. Uh, he has them lower down, and he has also got a small cupola above. Oak. Obviously, it doesn't rotate. And again, it is equipped with a whole bunch of these little vision slits. And I have to say, visibility is less than ideal. Yeah, definitely want to use the one piece hatch, flip it forward and look out with that instead. The machine gun is a water cooled, uh, hence the large armored jacket on the outside. Uh, it is on a ball mount with a little bit of spring stabilization, although it's frozen in place, so I can't demonstrate. There are additional ports for pistols, if for some reason you can't swing the machine gun around. And that's it for the commander's position. Now, uh, he shares the compartment with the other crewmen. And the question of how many crewmen are in this thing is a matter of some debate. Now, the minimum is two. You're going to have the driver, you're going to have the commander gunner. Uh, the museum data sheet says four, and the answer could be any of the above, or three, or however many can fit in here. And the reason for this is that there are additional machine gun mounts on the two walls. There's one on the back door and one in the front hall. And so as long as you had spare machine guns and you could cram more people in here, that's how many people you, you operated uh, inside the tank. And uh, the other nice thing about this nice big cavernous area is that if necessary, you can use it for other purposes, like uh, you, know, you put a stretcher in here, for example, and use it for evacuation for if you felt the need for one reason or another. Lots of room for spare ammunition in the boxes here. And really nothing else in this compartment. So uh, let's move forward and have a quick look at the driver's seat. driver's position and for a vehicle that's almost 100 years old this actually isn't bad I mean there's certainly been worse there are of course caveats for example visibility out the front is negligible you have the same really small slit that you're trying to look out of now that said if you're in a non-combat situation it is possible to simply lift up the visor with its bulletproof metal and you have a nice wide view to look out of. For the controls, it is worth noting that the modern standardization of vehicle controls didn't really come about until I think it was the 1920s in Cadillac. So the pedals are not what you'd expect. The clutch is indeed on the left, but the one in the middle is the accelerator, the one on the right is the brake. And I do note also, as you push down the brake, you start to push down on the clutch as well. So perhaps this is a way of reducing the chances of stalling. Uh, the clutch itself, it's a cone clutch with leather faceplates. So that shows you just how much torque is going through the transmission system. Steering is conducted by use of the traditional two tillers. Um, the one on the right is bent inwards in order to clear the armored housing and as you pull back it disengages a clutch on one side and then applies the brake. Nothing particularly unusual there. Gear stick is on the right hand side more or less as you would expect it to be albeit it is rather tight against the armored plate and it appears to be a four-speed gearbox. 
Finally, to his left, he's got the whole machine gun port, uh, which I presume he would be the man firing it, and this seems to be a tradition that stayed on a few years in Swedish tank design. Dials to the front, well, there aren't really any. There's one there for the oil, and that's it. So at least it keeps it simple for the driver. He's got nothing to monitor. That's pretty much it for the driver's hole. There's not much in it. And remember, this is a 1920s or so tank. And looking around it, it's, it's kind of fascinating just how much you've changed over the years. Well, the egress isn't too bad. So that was the M21. Now the vehicle, of course, had issues over its service life because it kept breaking down. It was old, unreliable, early technology. So what they would do is as a vehicle broke down, if they wanted to get spare parts, they'd simply turn it into a donor vehicle and cannibalize the fleet. Now eventually the solution was going to be an upgrade. Five of the vehicles were upgraded to the M29 standard. To do this, they replaced the Daimler engine with a Scania Vabis 85 horsepower, add a new gearbox, new exhaust. This gets you to a whopping 18 kilometers an hour, a two kilometer an hour increase. They also took a look at adding a high explosive capable gun, a 37 millimeter. Initially, this came from a French FT, although later it was a Skoda that they had a look at. Finding a photograph, however, of the tank with the 37mm appears to be all but impossible. Uh, various people have tried in the archives. The vehicle was used primarily for testing and evaluation purposes until 1938. Now remember, at this time in tank history, nobody had entirely figured out the concept of the tank anyway. So this was a learning vehicle. And it did set the stage for the Swedish armored production system. Uh, which was sort of unique over its many years and is still producing some of the finest fighting vehicles in the world today. So that was the Tier 1 of the Swedish line and we'll be back in future episodes to have a look at some of the later tanks they came up with. We'll see you then.